My name is Shane. For those who are new, welcome back if you're returning. Today we have another interview to take a look at. It seems like Micah has at least three sisters because we are now going to listen from Abigail Francis, another Francis sister we have yet to hear from. We are just going to listen in to what they have to say. So this week our media outlet traveled to Conway in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for a court hearing, a probate court hearing involving the case of Micah Miller. This is a story which has attracted international attention. Now, at that hearing, a surprise settlement was announced between the family of Micah Miller and John Paul Miller and Solid Rock Church. Now, this was a global settlement, meaning it encompassed all actions involving all of the parties to this case. Now, it was a surprise announcement, and it was greeted in some circles with consternation and criticism. But in the hours leading up to the settlement, I sat down for the first time ever on camera with Abigail Francis, the youngest sister of Micah Miller, and what ended up being her final interview before the settlement was reached, literally just an hour before the settlement was reached. Here in its entirety is my conversation with Abby Francis. I'm trying to find how many sisters Micah has, and it looks like there's an, even an interview with another sister named Destiny. We've heard from Sierra, we've heard from Anna or Anna, we've now, or we're going to be hearing from Abigail, and there's a Destiny as well. I want to thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. Obviously, this is something your family never could have imagined. Can you just tell us the last three months of life for your family, your sisters, your parents. What has it been like having to go through this international story? But for you, it's not some international story. It's your sister. Honestly, unreal. Um, if I talk too much about it, it it's just, it's mind blowing to feel or to understand that this is even real. Like when I got the call, I was like, is, is this real? Why, what is even happening, you know? And to just think about Micah and her words are still in my brain all the time. And whenever we would hang out with her, her and I would go on beach walks constantly. It was me and my sister. And whenever she was in the other situation, when she was still there, I didn't have those moments with her. And when she was finally herself in her own area, living in her own apartment it was like i got my sister back and we could have those sister moments and those sister talks and you know it's very bizarre to me that micah didn't choose a beach as the place if she did end up uh committing suicide i wonder why she wouldn't have chosen a beach because even abigail right now is talking about going on walks on the beach with her sister we've seen pictures of micah at the beach we know that when jp was having that conversation with dj which I might actually do the second part to that interview on camera as well. It was just, it was so bizarre. But even then, JP said that she was at the beach. So, you know, Micah choosing that state park as a place to be is just so bizarre still. I think she would have chosen, if anything, a beach. We would go to lunch together and it, w it was like nothing ever happened. And she used her experiences to grow as a person and to help everybody around her and consistently uplift everybody else in her circumstances. So it was basically like having my sister again and then for it to be completely ripped away. There aren't really any words. But before you lost her, she would be ripped away for long periods mm -hmm. by John Paul. He would forbid her to see you, to speak with you, uh, isolating her from your entire family. Obviously, we know how difficult that was for her, but what was that like for your family to not be able to to talk to her, to see her during those times when you knew she was struggling? A lot of what was going on, she didn't tell us. So there are some things that we weren't aware of because she kept that from us. And even learning some just different people throughout this whole thing, they're like, so where, where were you during this time? It's like, she didn't call me. I had no idea. And she, to my understanding, is she just didn't want us to know what was going on, especially on 
Yeah, a lot of victims that go through these types of things might be ashamed or don't really want to hear that I told you so or um, think that they can fix things and don't want to talk to family about it. Uh, that's very common and I do believe what Abigail's saying right now. Everybody's saying, well, where were you? Probably blaming a lot of the family for not stepping in, but you also have to realize that Micah probably kept a lot to herself as well because she's trying to put on that front of having a happy um, and faithful marriage with J.P. Miller. I can imagine a lot of this information is new to not only us, but to the Francis sisters as well. You're my little sibling. I don't want you to know everything that I'm going through. And just talking with her about things that she was going through she would always just say, you have to remember in those times when we weren't talking, I was under duress. I tell you couldn't, that. Yeah, she's like, I, I couldn't talk to you in those moments. And if we didn't have a relationship with a specific person, then we couldn't have a relationship with her. And if we didn't have holidays at specific areas, then we couldn't have her there with us. So it was pretty much give and take and be present whenever you could, honestly. We would maybe get five minutes with her. We could go get a coffee. Some days we wouldn't even see her. I would call her and I would get five minutes with her on the phone and then we wouldn't see her for a while. So it was definitely back and forth. Sister, are, are you still my sister or are you someone who's going through their own thing? And everything that kept going back and forth, like even the last couple of months when her and I were talking, it's like, what was going on in this situation? And she sometimes wouldn't want me to know. And I think a lot of it, too, is just her being that older sister and not wanting everybody to know what she was going through. She did. I wonder what the relationship was like between the sisters before JP's involvement really amped up. Were the sisters always close? Or were they siblings that were a little bit more distant and would just kind of communicate with one another maybe, you know, once a month or over the holidays or something? Micah did not want anybody to know the full extent of whatever she was going through because she didn't want to drag anybody down. She didn't want to out anybody else's sins because that's, as a Christian, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to throw stones. You're not supposed to tell anybody like, hey, they did me wrong. That's, God is the vengeance and... And you know what? I believe Micah is gonna, uh, well, she's gonna hold true to that promise where she's not exposing anything. I think God is putting people in the right place to be able to expose this case for what it is. We'll handle it. So it's not up for us to say, he did so-and-so or they did so-and-so. It'll come out eventually by their own undoing and it'll be taken care of. You've seen, obviously, we've called it the totality of the abuse that mm -hmm. your sister endured, the harassment, the destruction of her property, of uh, isolation, of manipulation, of gaslighting, all these narcissistic moves by this man. Let me ask you this, you had occasion to know this John Paul Miller. Is he a false prophet? This guy telling the church one thing about your sister uh, in an effort to try to perhaps absolve himself of what he's done, but you had an up close look at both of these two people. Tell me what you saw when you when you looked at, at John Paul Miller. It's kind of a difficult question for me to answer because for one, being family, and then for two, I did attend the church, and he was my pastor for a while. And at one point, I would question why I'm even there constantly. And it was always led back to, Mike is your sister, she needs help, out of the obligation of not only helping the body of Christ, because if you're a Christian and the, Bible, and the church says, we need help, you step up wherever they need you. But for your sister to say, hey, I am really in the weeds and I really need your help, can you please help me? It went back and forth with that. And I always wanted to help Micah in any way that I could. And I did help her in every way that I could. And it just, it just kept feeling like each one of my arms was being pulled. And I had to remove myself and say, I, I just can't do it anymore. But I'm still here for you when you need me. And I'm, I'm just, I can't be there at that church. I can be in your life and I can help you in every way, especially with you being my sister, based, not even based on any circumstances that were happening, but you're my sister and I want you to be a part of my life. And it just kept getting pulled back and forth. Well, if you're not involved in this, then you can't hang out with her during this, or you hung out with her during this, so she's already had that time hanging out with the family, so now she's gonna go do this. And it was constant 
we were being told when we can hang out with her rather than us just hanging out. And that extended after she died too, didn't it? Walk us through some of that. What happened after you heard and when you had to interact with him? I haven't seen him. I have not seen him. I have not talked to him. I've done nothing. There is no reason anymore. My only reason to have any involvement with him was because of Micah. I have no intention of talking about him, talking to him, going anywhere near him. I don't have a reason. Let me ask you this, though. Do you want to see justice done on this earth to him? And if so, let me ask you this. What would that look like? Anything that happens on this earth, justice-wise, I believe for Micah's individual circumstances, we'll be getting Micah's law passed. Because for one, it has her name in it. And for two, the system failed her. And everything that happened could have been prevented. I 100% believe that. If you didn't see part two of Regina Ward's uh, interview, by the way, allegedly JP has a problem with Micah's name being in this law. It's a control bill that was submitted in 2021, 2020. If that were to pass, she would still be here. And the only justice that if we can see because in the beginning, I didn't want Micah to be known as a domestic violence victim or an abuse victim or anything like that because she's much more than that. And now my hair's purple. <laughs> so it's like you, you have to go back and forth with realizing and coming to terms with, is she going to get any justice, period? And that would be Micah's law. And for anybody else in those circumstances, yeah, I would love for them to get their own justice. That, if they can find any way... I would say go for it, and for that, for, for it to be a thing, I really don't know. But at the end of the day, something's going to happen, because we all got to answer someone. And accountability needs to be taken in account. <laughs> you can't just do something. And I mean, biblical terms, yeah, sure, you repent, God's going to forgive you. But worldly terms, you have to accept responsibility, and the actions that you do, there are consequences. So if there are, if you, if someone can get these consequences lined up, then I truly believe that it's, it's going to happen. But it's, if Micah's law is not here and there's nothing for them to go off of, then people are going to keep manipulating the non-existent system that South Carolina doesn't have. Manipulated law enforcement, manipulated his parishioners. Um, Correct. And also we have... We talked uh, briefly about trying to pass laws that would help potential future victims, holding people accountable for doing so. It was a difficult system. It was a broken system. It was a system that needed some serious revising. We've heard allegations that there are other victims. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, John Paul Miller's first wife explicitly laid out some of those allegations in one of the filings related to this case. Is that what drives you? And we're going to talk in a minute about some of the work you're doing, because uh, you're not just sitting around in the aftermath of this. You're very, very busy, and we're going to talk about some of the projects you've got going here, Abby. But um, as you think about those potential future victims, if you will, of people like John Paul, again, assuming all these allegations are true, which you know, we've got a pretty incredible stack of evidence here, but if Michael were here and looking at the situation and looking at what's happened in the aftermath of, of her death, where would her focus be, do you think? What do you think would be most important to her? You knew her as well and better than, than anyone. What do you think would be what she would want to see in terms of that accountability? The mission strip. She started that. She founded it. And for it to be taken into... Sorry about that. She's always wanted to be the Angelina Jolie mixed with Carrie Jo. She wanted to be that Christian artist that helped people, as well as Angelina Jolie, going to Africa and helping these children that need help and being the missionary. She loved going and doing that and realized that her purpose on earth is not just to be a servant for one person. She always said... My purpose as this position, either if it was a wife or a pastor's wife or a sister or a stepmother or whatever it was, 
it always got boiled down to one purpose. And people have many purposes in life. God has multiple plans for your life. It's not just one big thing. There are many things that attribute to that. And the biggest thing that she was really focusing on was being a missionary and helping the children. And for that to be used against her and ripped away, Held over. That's, that's very malicious. No matter who you are, no matter what your connections are, to use that against anybody I don't know why anybody would do that. In a normal circumstance, I believe that it would just end up going to his spouse. Um, in this case, where obviously Micah is not here, to be able to defend her side of the estate, um, that's where Sierra Francis was stepping in. Just the way that JP has spoken about his wife, even well before all of this started, I would really just hate to see it go to anybody else besides the Francis family. This is leverage, wasn't it? Correct. We were talking earlier with Attorney Ward, and I wanted to see if you agreed with this too, that one of Micah's key focuses in all of this was to keep people from being driven from the church, to keep people from having a bad taste in their mouth when they thought of church. And you've obviously seen in the aftermath of this that there have been a lot of folks who have come down on Christianity, they've come down on organized religion, when you see those kind of statements, what what do you feel? What, what does that make you think? One of the biggest things that we said in the middle of her memorial service was do not let this affect your relationship with God. Because at the end of the day, it's not about what your religion is or what the organization you attend and what their rules are. It's about your personal relationship with God and having that divine awakening, if you want to call it that. You go to church, for yourself, to be around like-minded people, to worship God, to learn, and to have that community, not just to put someone else on a pedestal and to listen what they say for 30, 40 minutes, and then you go home. A lot of people are seeing that and getting in the routine and forgetting that it's all about relationship with God. You can go and hear the word and not obtain any of it. And you just, okay, well, I went to church today, or I went to Bible study today, or I read my devotional today, but they don't have that meaningful awareness or just comprehending it. And it's so much deeper than that. People see church as a top surface thing when it's so much deeper than that. God has angels up there worshiping Him 24-7. Church is for us. It's for the body to come together and be together with like-minded people and continue to be the body of Christ. And for people to use that against someone, some, for someone to use somebody's testimony against them, that is so low. That's why we're all together because you go to a hospital because you're sick. You go to church, a lot of sick people there spiritually, and it it's kind of goes hand in hand with it. You don't just go to church because you're already saved. People go to church to get saved and to stay in that community to grow each other and to help each other. There's so many ministries out there who come from really, really bad backgrounds, but God got them out of it and taught, him, taught them how to be better people and how to help the people in that atmosphere. If nobody went into those different situations, they wouldn't know how to connect to those people, how to evangelize to those people, how to get those people out of those circumstances because they were in it. And God uses people in many ways. And for, again, someone to use that against you. You know, all the girls that I've heard speak so far are really soft and well-spoken. And I can't imagine Micah's demeanor is too far off from this. But even the way they just speak lovingly about their religion, you can tell that this hasn't even deterred them away from loving God. I'm really just enjoying hearing her speak because you can tell it's coming from a place of passion. That is very malicious, very evil, and it is the complete opposite of what God would want and what God does. God is love and mercy and grace. Without God's grace and God's mercy, there would just, there would be nothing. And Every day we wake up, every time we do something, that's God's grace and God's mercy and God's love helping us and getting us through the day. When you saw the announcement from John Paul Miller the day after your sister's death, 
where he, as you mentioned, used used her testimony against her, used you know everything he knew or claimed to know against her. What went through your mind when you heard him make that announcement? I actually didn't see it for a couple of days after, and I kind of skipped through to the end. Someone sent it to me, and I was just in shock too. I really don't have words for that. People do what they do, sometimes for no reason, just because they can. And that's something very hard that I've had to keep continuously learning and keep in the back of my mind for years. I'm a why person. Why did you do that? What was your reasoning? What was your motive? What was your intent? And sometimes people just do things because they can. There is no reason. There is no motive. There is no intent. They just, they can, so they do. She's right. And you're fighting to preserve the integrity of religion for those, even though she's clearly dealing with you know, the right. situation that's completely beyond the pale. But then the second after she dies, you've got him mm -hmm. manipulating it. Doesn't piss you off? I think there's a difference between worldly anger and righteous angry. Whenever you're righteously angry, God's got it. He'll figure it out. I have no ill intent for anything. And that's very hard for anybody to say and to truly mean. And again, I don't want to see him. I have no intent to see him. I have no reason to see him. Similar to what it sounded like Micah was saying where she's like, I don't want to be a victim. I don't want to talk about JP. I don't want to talk about the the DV that I went through and the essays that I went through. I don't want to. I just want to move on. They just all seem very much like we just want to move on. We want as a little people to get hurt as possible. We just want people to come and love God and not have this affect that. The only reason I had to see him was for Micah and she's gone. I want to ask you now a little bit about what you've been doing these past few months since this tragedy befell your family. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you were not sitting still. You're not taking any of this lying down. In addition to working on, on the law, you've got a big benefit concert coming up. Tell us a little bit about the concert, but more importantly, the bigger effort behind what the concert's trying yeah. to do. Yeah, so there's a couple main points of to having the concert is one, to sh shine light on Micah and who she was and who she is because her light will not be dimmed by anybody anymore. This will be the biggest way of us screaming Micah's name in every way. There's gonna- I'm curious about that concert or a benefit they're running for Micah. The vendors, there's gonna be food trucks, there's going to be a kid zone, local bands are going to be playing, and Micah loved music. That was one way that our family does connect, is just if we hear a good song, whether it's Christian or not, we're like, oh, that's awesome, let's send it to you, you know? And even if you're not, like sometimes whenever I said like we weren't speaking with Micah, I would just send her a song, and she would either heart it or say, oh, I really like that song, that to my playlist, or something like that. So for the community to come together and come back to the word community, is one of the biggest things too. It's because we don't really have a community. You might have these small little groups that you go to and small little Bible studies or book studies or whatever you wanna do, little meetings. We don't have community anymore. And so this benefit concert will push Micah's law, push who Micah is, get people aware of the situation because there's still a lot of people here who don't know whenever people states away know. And it's like, okay, so if our own community still doesn't know what's going on, really, let's have a benefit concert. Let's get the community together and get different organizations in line to where if someone comes to this event and they need help, someone's right there to help them. Yeah, and these are also the folks that the local politicians will listen to, the, the oh, community. Mm -hmm. the yeah, ones. and while we're trying to get Micah's law revised and put together, because it's going to be the course of control law, included with some things from Micah's list of alleged abuse that she went through, and I have to say alleged because she's not here to say it. So different things, and Micah wrote that list. There are a lot of people who keep asking who did this, who did that. That came straight from Micah. So for anybody to say, oh, well, 
how do you know what's true and what's not from different interviews coming up? Like just said, researching while she's talking. All you talking. have to do is listen. And sometimes whenever you talk, you can hear somebody, but that doesn't mean you're actually listening. That doesn't mean you're comprehending what they're saying. You're just blank slate and you're sitting there. And a lot of that I find is what's happening throughout this last couple of months is people are saying, oh yeah, we heard about that. Okay, well, what'd you hear? Did you, did you see Micah's list? Well, no, what's that? Okay, so then you didn't hear, you didn't listen, you weren't paying attention, and I'm glad that some people are saying, oh yeah, sure, I know about that. Okay, but do you really know about it? And I, I don't mean to make it sound in a bad way, but again, this is real. This is someone's life. This is not just a fiction thing that happened to one person and then it's getting blown up into... I am listening to her, by the way. I'm just looking up Micah's list as she's speaking. ...bigger than what it actually is. This is a serious problem. This is a serious issue. And Micah's not the only person who went through it. She's just the first person who's been able to stand up and her voice being heard. And her voice to be heard when she's not even here, that's amazing. And not a lot of people get that chance. And I get people messaging me saying, oh, I want to help. I want to do this. I'm in a similar situation. How, what can I do to help? Okay, let's get together. Let's get the community together. And again, come back to what community means and continue to be that body and that support. Whether you're Christian or not, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not. If you want to help and you want to be a part of it and your motives are in the right way, come on, let's do it. Let's get everybody aware. Abby, I want to ask you this. You mentioned earlier you would steal five minutes on the phone with Micah or you'd be able to steal a quick cup of coffee with her when she was enduring all of this isolation and abuse. If you were able to steal five minutes with her now or steal a cup of coffee with her right now, what do you think you'd say to her? What do you think she'd say to you? As in her being in heaven and the things I would ask her about that, or her being on this earth? Because that's a million, a million answers to that question. Um, I would just hang out with her. One of the last times we were together, we were walking on the beach. And she told me how proud of me she was, of the things that I've accomplished and being the young adult woman that I am and being the baby. Because being the youngest, no one sees you as an adult, even though you're an adult. And there were a lot of positions that I was in with Micah that helped her see me as an adult. Being a youth group leader, being a worship leader, my position at work where I was an office manager or things like that. And on my birthday, she would surprise me with chocolate covered strawberries. She was, we, we do that for our family. We make each other feel special because if, if your person isn't, we will. All right, so that explains a little bit of what kind of relationship the girls had with one another. So seemingly a pretty close bond between the siblings. No reason for you to not feel special because you are special. You were put here on this earth for a reason, whether you think of it or not. And for someone to belittle that and make you feel not important, makes me so mad <laughs> so she definitely helped make you feel special and whenever we were together she would always have her phone turned down and I asked her one day I said why do you do that you know it's like some people do it for different reasons and you know and I said why do you turn your phone upside down and she said because the minutes that I do get with you I want you to know that I'm paying attention to you Aww. and that you are the only thing on my mind right now because she was the organizer for many many things in her title that she had for work and other things that she did. So she wanted you to make sure that you had her full attention and that she was there to see you. Because again, if we only had five minutes, we had an hour, we had lunch, that was sometimes all that we got. So she wanted to make sure that you were, you had her full attention and that you felt like a priority in her life. And I would, if I had five more minutes with her, we would be under the pier listening to worship music, hanging in our hammocks. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, that was the full interview. So we have some more stuff to take a look at in our next video. Let me know what you guys think down below. Also, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you don't want to miss any new videos. And I will see you in my next one.